sings to the choir. And again, our thanks to all the young people who have been helping out with worship leadership this morning. Ryan, thanks for taking on that passage from Jeremiah. <laughs> Hard words, thank you. Be fearful when others are greedy, and greedy when others are fearful. Be fearful when others are greedy, and greedy when others are fearful. Do you know who said that? Yeah, it's not from the Bible. It's not from a fortune cookie. It's uh, Warren Buffett. If you know Warren Buffett, that's who said it. So, let's say you're like me, and you don't own any property in the Lower Mainland. Is this a time to be fearful? Or is it a time to be greedy? It seems to be on the minds of lots of people these days, but I'm no Warren Buffett, and apparently neither was the prophet Jeremiah. It's got to be probably the worst real estate transaction in the entire Bible. If Eleanor was advising Jeremiah, this would have never happened. <laughs> Jeremiah was a prophet in the southern land of Israel, known at that time as the Kingdom of Judah. During an increasingly desperate time in Judah's history, when the king of Babylon, a guy named Nebuchadnezzar, was besieging Jerusalem. And Jeremiah tells the king of Judah, a guy named Zedekiah, that God had told him that he would give Jerusalem over to the Babylonians, and that the king himself would be taken prisoner. Well, nobody likes a Debbie Downer for a prophet, right? You don't want a prophet who keeps on saying, oh, it's all bad, it's all bad. What is God telling you today? Oh, it's all bad. So Jeremiah gets thrown in prison for his constant negativity. So while he's under arrest, he gets a visit from his cousin, a guy named Hanamel. And Hanamel has got this great idea that he's got some swamp land in Florida that he wants Jeremiah to take off his hands. It's not quite swamp land in Florida. It's actually worse than that. Hanamel has got this piece of land. It's a field in a place called Anatoth. And it's in the territory of the tribe of Benjamin, of the Benjaminites. The only problem with this territory is that it's about to be overrun by the Babylonians, right? So Hanamel goes to Jeremiah, who's all locked up, in, you know, house arrest, and he says, Jeremiah, you're my closest relative. It's your right and it's your duty to purchase this land and keep it in the family. Shockingly, Jeremiah says, okay, I'll do it. And he duly shells out 17 shekels of silver for his cousin's field. Now, I have no idea whether that's a good price or not. 17 shekels of silver really is only about 8, pounds, eight ounces of silver, which is not a whole like a lot of money today. And back then, maybe it was a good price, maybe it was a fair price. I don't know, but it really doesn't matter, does it? Because... Jeremiah is never, ever going to see that field that he's just bought. The Babylonians are going to capture the land, in fact, all of Judah. They're going to destroy the homes, they're going to burn their temple in Jerusalem, and they're going to take the people of Judah into exile, into Babylon, to a faraway land where the psalmist writes, there they will sit by the rivers of Babylon and weep as they remember Zion. Jeremiah is not going to live to possess this land that he buys from his cousin. But according to our text, he goes, through, he goes to extravagant lengths to make sure that the transaction of this property exchange is properly witnessed and documented. And copies of the deed of purchase are given to his secretary, Baruch. And he tells Baruch to place them inside an earthenware jar so that they may last for a very long time. For what purpose? For what purpose? We might be tempted to ask. What good is owning land that you could never use? What good is owning property that you could never utilize or occupy? But of course, we know that Jeremiah's purchase of the field at Anatoth has nothing to do with whether or not he'd ever live there. It's clear that he'll never live there. This was not a business decision. This was not a business decision. This was an act of audacious hope. This was an act of hope. To the people who were witnesses to Jeremiah's purchase of the field, it must have seemed like utter madness. You're, you're buying a field? Where? Do you know what's going on? The Babylonians are besieging us? Like, what good is that field going to do for you, Jeremiah? It must have seemed like utter madness. 
God had said that the land would be overrun by the Babylonians, Jeremiah would never get to use that land. It was throwing good money after bad. And to the eyes of the world, Jeremiah must have seemed like a fool. Like, you know, not only are you negative about everything, but you're like the worst business guy ever. And why would you buy this field? But Jeremiah, being a prophet, had also heard from the Lord that he was, he was to redeem the land by purchasing it purchasing it from his cousin, because as clear as God was about the coming calamity that was about to overtake the people of Judah, God was just as clear in God's promise that one day houses and fields and vineyards would again be bought in the land of Israel. So this isn't just any field, this is a field of dreams, right? Jeremiah isn't investing in land, in a piece of property. He's investing in hope. Jeremiah is investing in hope. He's investing in God's promise. And isn't that what we're doing right now? Isn't that what we're doing right now? Isn't that what the church does every time we gather for worship? We're investing in hope. We are investing in hope. Like Jeremiah, in our worship, we are laying claim to a territory that the whole world tells us is about to be overrun. Not by Babylonians, not by developers, or by any identifiable people group, but overrun by a sense of inevitability. That things are going to go a certain way. And there's really nothing that you or I can do about it, so rather than fighting it, we might as well get with the program. Right? We might as well join, embrace it, accept it. And I wonder, what is it that seems inevitable in your life? What is it that seems inevitable in your life and in our life together? What seems inevitable? What is it that threatens to overrun us? I think Jeremiah would be quite familiar with our present context. Because I think there is a bit of pessimism, or maybe a lot of pessimism, about a great many things in our world today. Maybe a lot of it gets, maybe a lot of it gets embodied in a particular man with orange-colored skin. Uh, the one world leader who makes the dictator of North Korea seem like a rational, reasonable person. <laughs> Maybe it's divisiveness. Maybe it's racial strife. Maybe it's the economic stratification between the haves and the have-nots. Maybe it's the sense of simmering anger, or blame, or fear that a lot of us feel. That somehow we are being besieged by forces beyond our control. We feel it here in Richmond too, don't we? Or wherever it is that you might be living, we feel it here. We're not immune from a growing sense of, of nativism or negativity around our own issues. We read in the papers all the time. We watch it on TV. Maybe it's a growing sense of secularity, that people are moving away from religion and faith. Fear that our future generations won't have anything near the connections that are former generations or that our generation has with faith. Maybe that's our fear. Or it might be more personal. Maybe what seems inevitable is the brokenness of a past that can never be recovered. The band Nine Inch Nails wrote a song called Hurt and, uh, and Johnny Cash sang a version of it. And he says that our lives, our lives are full of broken thoughts that we cannot repair. Full of broken thoughts that we cannot repair. Is it this sense of regret? Is it the sense of remorse? Is it the guilt or the shame, the disappointment? The decline in our health, in our bodies, in our minds, in our spirits? The deterioration, the deterioration in our relationships, in our finances, in those we love? You know, we'll, we'll never have what we once had, and there never seems to be enough time left to truly make amends. And the inevitability of it all can seem rather overwhelming at times. And yet, and yet, we are laying, we are laying claim to territory in this world, in this land which seems to be being overrun every time we worship, every time we gather for worship, every time we put our hands together for prayer, every time we open our mouths to sing praises, open our minds and our hearts to hear a life-giving word, we are laying claim to 
to this territory. We're laying claim to this space. Being part of this community, belonging to this community, we are God's family together. We are God's family. And every time we gather to worship, to fellowship, this is an act of hope. We are investing in hope. It's an act of audacious hope. Being the community of God's people is about investing in hope. In the hope that not everything is as, as it seems on the surface. That something's going on. Something that we can't always see. Something that God is doing. The Babylonians were going to come and they were going to ransack the land. But they would not have the final word because God, God always has the final word. And God's word is one of restoration, hope, and promise. The forces of our world, whether they be division or separation or segregation or pain, anger or death, they may seem to us to be inevitable, but the truth is, my friends, they will not have the final word. God will. God always has the final word. And God's word is not judgment, but redemption. Not judgment, but redemption. There's enough judgment in the world, and we know the harsh bite of judgment all too well. But the heart of Jeremiah's message is God's promise of redemption. That God is with God's people. As our young people told us, that God is with God's people, that God never gives up on us and is creating a future for them, even in their darkest hour, even when the people themselves see no need for it. I see brokenness, brokenness and barrenness. They're never the final words. We we're community, we're God's family. We worship it as God's people because we're investing in hope. We're investing in the hope that despite what seems to be our brokenness and our barrenness, despite what seems to be inevitable, nothing, nothing is irrecoverable, nothing is beyond repair because God, our God, is still at work. Our God is still at work creating for us a future even if we don't always see the need for it. Every time we worship, we invest in the hope of God's redemption. The world might think that we're utterly mad, that we're fools, but we know better. We know better. And if we're a community that's invested in hope, then that hope has to inform how we live today. That hope has to inform how we live today. You know, there is a lot that's not right with the world today, and it might seem to be a futile thing to invest against such seemingly overwhelming odds. But our worship isn't about investing in the temporal realities of this life. Rather, it's about investing in the eternal hope promised by God. Now, like Jeremiah, what we invest in, the things we invest in, we may never live long enough to see bear fruit, right? We invest in things that we may never live long enough to see bear fruit. I think somebody said, uh, if you want to invest in wheat, if you want to invest for a year, uh, plant wheat. If you want to invest for like 10 years, plant trees. If you want to invest for 100 years, plant people. We're investing in the eternal things from God. We may never live to see some of the things that we invest in bear fruit. We may not always be, be able to get the harvest ourselves. But if you're going to invest something, if you're going to invest something, you've got to risk something, right? You can't invest without risking. Our worship, our hope, it's not only about what we do in here, in this place that seems relatively safe. It's about what we do out there. It's about what we do out there. What would we risk out there? What are you willing to risk out there? What are you being called to risk? What do you think we, as the church, as Richmond Presbyterian Church, is being called to risk? Are you being called to risk your sense of security? You know, that, that sense of go along to get along? No one really thinks of you in a weird way? Is that what you're being called to risk? Is it to risk your reputation? Oh, I didn't know you were a Christian. Is that what you're gonna risk? Is it about risking your comfort? Why do I have to do something about that? Can't, can't, can't somebody else do something about that? Is it about risking our relationships? Is it about risking our time? We're busy enough as it is. Our energy, our imagination. 
Our sense of certainty, would we risk our sense of certainty that everything is what we think it should be? Even our faith, would we risk our faith to say, maybe out there as we risk, God will change us, and grow us, transform us. You know, it's probably not a piece of land. It's probably a person, a cause, a community, a vision that needs our willingness to risk and our investment of hope. What are you being called to risk? What are we being called to risk? 58 years is what we're celebrating today. 58 years of a faithful ministry as a congregation here in Richmond. We give thanks today, today to those whose commitment and conviction has made our congregation what it is today. We acknowledge that we stand on the shoulders of those giants of faith, of the saints who have come before us and that we too today have an obligation and a responsibility to leave a legacy of a healthy, vital congregation to those who will come after us. The way to do that, the way to do that, the way to continue to be a healthy, vital congregation is by risking what God has entrusted to us in serving the needs of the people, the community, the world around us, in investing in the needs of our community and the people who call Richmond their home. We may never live to see the fruits of the work that we begin today. Just like those who began this congregation 58 years ago may not be around to see what their active imagination and faithfulness has produced. But we need to risk in ways that open up opportunities for our children, for our young people, who are again not the future of our church, but are part of the present of our church. We need to invest in their gifts, in their growth, in their witness in our world. Maybe you feel good about our congregation today, as I do. Maybe you feel good about our congregation. But there will come times when maybe we won't feel so optimistic. The point is, no matter what, no matter what the current state of the church and of our congregation might be, our worship and our proclamation, our faithfulness, is our investment, is our investment in the hope of God, the God who is always faithful. So friends, may we be like Jeremiah, not in our negativity, but in our vision, in our hope. May we be like those who have heard a word from the Lord, that God has plans for God's people, and God's plans for God's creation are good plans, meant for our good, meant for all people's good. And then may we continue to act in ways that the world around us might think be foolish, like putting others ahead of ourselves, like listening to the voices of the powerless and the marginalized, like seeking justice before power, integrity before profit. May we invest in things in which we may never live to see or enjoy the fruits, and in people whom we may never live long enough to see the change, but in whom there may come a change because of our investment that might impact people around them in ways that we could never have imagined. May we live as disciples of the one whose greatest triumph was achieved by a sacrificial death on a barren cross. Our investment is not about being fearful when others are, are greedy or being greedy when others are fearful. That's not what our investment is about. Our investment is about sowing hope in the midst of every fear that the barren cross has led to an empty tomb that that seemingly powerless death has overwhelmed the forces of all darkness and of every sin. That we can't, but that while we can't change our past or maybe even control our future, our present, we can find our future in our faithful God. That nothing in life and death is inevitable except the love of God. Warren Buffett may be the sage of Omaha but he's not a prophet. If you want to invest in the stock market, he's probably a good guy to listen to. But if you want to really invest in hope, you'd be better off listening to Jeremiah. We would be better off listening to God. Thanks be to God. Amen.